Welcome to Talk of the Town, I'm Zach Booth. I co-produce this show along with Kim and Marie, as well as direct and edit it. If you're a regular viewer, you've probably heard me encouraging or criticizing them from off camera. I even make appearances in front of the camera from time to time. So why am I in front of the camera now? Well, we usually take a break in February. This year, I decided to start a new tradition for the months we take off. I've reviewed every episode we've ever produced over the show's more than eight year run and selected my favorite segments. This month, I'm presenting the first of a series of shows I'm calling Talk of the Town, Zach's Picks. Zach's Picks episodes will feature my favorite segments, unedited and in their entirety. The segments collected in each episode will also follow a unifying theme. We get started making things at Somersault Letterpress in Jim Thorpe. Somersault Letterpress is about kind of going back to the old craftsman style of printing. Um, we're mixing a little bit more of the modern technology so that things can be done a little faster and a little quicker um, and broaden the scope of what can actually be printed versus the old lead set type or wood blocks. So we can take anyone's logo or image or technology and apply it to these old presses. It's still one color at a time. Uh, everything's done by hand. So, um, but I think the end result is the, is the beauty of it and, and um, these presses are just awesome to work with. When people walk into our shop, they are greeted with cards that are a little different than something Hallmark or the grocery store might carry. It's more of an artistic presence and it's definitely a little more colorful in language. People from all walks of life come in, they see some of the language on our cards and they relate and laugh their way through the shop. It's, it's engaging and people are really responding to it well. This is a Chandler and Price from the 1930s. It's a hand-fed, uh, one sheet at a time by, by hand. It has a small motor. This is Amy's baby, Peanut. She loves running this thing. <laughs> when you talk about getting off the computer, if she could shut her computer off and just run this all day, that would be make her super happy. I have two other presses back here. These are Heidelberg windmills from the 1950s. There are a lot of them in the country um, that are still found in large commercial print shops. They just don't use them for printing anymore. They're kind of uh, die cutting and they sit in the back in the corners and kind of rust. Um, so it, it's a pleasure bringing all these back and scraping off that rust and dirt and oil um, and bringing them back to life. And you just put a little bit of oil and a little bit of love on them and they just run forever, just iron and steel and um, they create those beautiful images. What are we going to do today? Today we're going to print your fabulous note cards uh, <laughs> for Talk of the Town. Um, we're going to do that on the Heidelberg windmill. So what Amy did was take your file and uh, we sent out, this is the only part that we do out of um, town is uh, have this made in Philadelphia. Now we've taken, a, this, this is the photopolymer plate. All right, you're going to open did. that top drawer. Pull that open. This is our burn uh, burn drawer. Go ahead and set that in there. Then you'll put your film down on the, with the reverse image. You got it. So you, it reads backwards and upside down on there. Let's go ahead and hit start right there. All right. So we have four minutes, and the UV light will burn the image onto the photopolymer. When you're ready, roll that back off and pull the film off, and then you should be able to just see it. So mm -hmm. that has a steel back. That has a magnet. Go ahead and put it up there, and we're going to put it in the water bath and wash it out so uh, it'll wash away the, you the negative. Just drop it in put it right up the there, oh, right that. on the magnet. Like this? Other way. Other way. You got it. Mm -hmm. ah, there okay. you go. Okay. <laughs> now hit start on that. There you go. Now you'll really see the image on oh, there. Yeah. There cool. it is. Here is your chosen ink that we have. Oh, the purple. Eight, 814 purple oh. fluorescent. <laughs> right here. Don't fling it at her. Don't fling it at her. Okay, there's the good stuff down there in the bottom. Yeah, I see it. All right. It's a different color. So go ahead and dip that in there, and then I'm going to okay. have you put that right back here in the ink well. That's perfect. Just go ahead and slap it right over here on this side of the press. Now that roller right there, spin it towards you. You have to pull pretty hard. Yeah. There you go. And that'll get ink going on the roller there. Now, what I'm going to do is drop the rollers down, and I'm going to fire it up, and then we're going to allow 
this to ink the inking drum. So we let that run for just a little bit until we get a nice color. Smooth, it gets a nice, smooth nice and smooth and, and evens out. it out. It shuffles back and forth across the rollers to make sure it gets a nice even uh, formation on that. Here is your fluffy white double thick cotton stock here. So you feel that's nice. It's 100% cotton sheet. Oh my sheet. goodness. Yeah. yeah. It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it allows the ink to be really pushed into the paper that gives it that tactile feel. Yeah. So, um, so what I do, what I have to do now is cut the sheets down to the size of the, uh, of the card. Now this foot pedal down here brings a clamp down to hold the, play, the paper in place. These two buttons are your cut buttons, so just use your thumbs, push that, and away you, you go. You can push one. Both at the same, there you go. Ready, same time, set, man. go. Okay, let go. We just chopped wow. the paper in half. See how easy that was? Two whole reams. <laughs> <laughs> Done That's in one nasty. Cut. Wow. It is nasty, yeah. You don't yeah. want to get anywhere close to that. Um, basically, there's your finished plate. What we're going to do is put it in position. Um, this is about the size. We're going to try and get it in position at the top of the sheet, which will go right about there. And it jumps <laughs> right out of you. What? That's a serious magnet. It's like, boom. <laughs> Right Do you have a nickname for this press? This one's called Eva. 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 Kind of our. This was our first press. Kind of take on Eve. Eve. The Adam mm -hmm. and Eve uh, part of it. So this is Eva. All right. So we're gonna fire it up. Okay. There's our first one. Oh, oh very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Oh, nice. Now, wow. if you rub your finger over, you can feel the depth yep, that we feel. pushed that in there. It's like the embossed. Nice job. That's all you guys. You guys did it. <laughs> when Mitch and I met, we he was in commercial printing and I was in graphic design and we worked really well as a team on very complicated, beautiful invitations, event invitations of all sorts. How many did you guys want? <laughs> We realized that the economy was going in a different direction. It was going too fast, cheap, easy, and we really wanted to stick with what we did best, which was higher end caliber work as far as design and printing. And last one. Done. And done. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Eva did a nice job today. Yes, Eva did a nice Eva job. Eva today. Yeah, Eva did great. Final cut. Ready? And there's your talk of the town corner. There you go. Yay! Now the Thank real you. test is you have to make sure it fits in the envelope. <laughs> we'll see how good you guys are. Aww. Does it work? Does it fit in the envelope? It does. We cut well. You did too. <laughs> nice work. Nice work. <laughs> Those are talking to town note cards. Awesome. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> now this press is a little bit smaller and looks like it's a little more hands-on than the one we saw back there. A little more hands-on for sure. And older too. Uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, it's a Kelsey Excelsior tabletop press. And how much ink do we need? We only need a small amount, probably that's not about not good, not. and then place it around the disc because we're going to be doing this manually, and that's probably good there. The press is not inking itself, so we're going to have to do that manually. So we're going to take the brayer, mm -hmm. and you're basically going to zip, zip, zip mm -hmm. over the ink and start spreading it out. I think we might be good. Let's let's give it a shot. So you're going to push and down all the way. Ta-da! It's a little heavy on the ink. Oh, I think it looks pretty it good. It looks really great. It's very pretty. Yeah. This is what we use in the studio. We usually have this inked up on the weekends. And we've had uh, small children, four years old or so, even pulling down on the handle, making some prints here in the studio. When everyone's texting and emailing and you know Facebook and all of that and so fast, we feel like when someone has an important message and a wedding invitation, a thank you, um, you know, birthday cards, everything like that, um, you you write it down, write a handwritten handwritten note. You take the time to do that. We want to take the time to make something beautiful, and these old presses allow us to do that. We're a couple local people now, I feel like, that want to produce and live and work in this town, uh, make things that go out across the country that say handmade in historic Jim Thorpe.
We try to keep our focus inside our coverage area, but sometimes we'll expand our range to bring our viewers something that can't be found within it. Connects are made in a 130,000 square foot facility in Hatfield, Pennsylvania. The Rodon Group is a high volume plastic injection molder with over 100 presses. There are lots of practical items rolling off the factory floor. The principle is always the same. The, the raw plastic gets sucked in, mixed with colorant, melted, cooled under high pressure. That's the injection of the plastic and then the molding all happening at the same time. And then the parts come out. Kim and I saw some of the five billion parts they produce every year. They make things you never think about, like handles for big water jugs, bright red caps for energy drinks, and filters for inside the single serve coffee K cups. Tucked amongst all things practical is something really fun. Connects. How much fun is it to run a toy company? <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I have one of the best gigs on the planet. Um, I get to now make all the stuff that I played with as a kid. So, you know, I grew up learning how to read on Sesame Street, then we made Sesame Street building sets. I grew up then playing Nintendo games, and then we make Nintendo, Mario Kart Wii, and Super Mario sets. My kids started you know, with Angry Birds, I started playing Angry Birds, then we made Angry Birds building sets. So all that stuff, Tinker Toys, Lincoln Logs, all the stuff that is just from all of our childhood, to then be able to recreate it, imagine it as a building toy, and see millions of kids enjoying it around the world, is just fantastic. They start with boring, colorless plastic. A million pounds of the plastic pellets are stored in silos. But before they create anything, the Rodon Group does all their own design and all their own tool making. Is it more fun designing window latches and lip balm or toys? <laughs> toys. <laughs> <laughs> Bring on the toys. So then once you mix in the color, the mold that we made in the other rooms is in the press now. The plastic is getting melted and cooled under pressure and then it comes right off the press here. Are they warm? And yeah, it's a little warm. Yeah. And you'll see, that's where hot off the presses come yeah, from. hot off the presses. Here come the green ones. These yellow rods for your Connects toys are literally hot off the press. The best part about Connects? They're made in the USA. Like many other companies, they did outsource work overseas. But in 2008, they started bringing the work back home. Now more than 200 employees work in Hatfield for Rodon and Kinex. Over the last five years, we've moved about 95% of the production back here. And we're making a vast majority of the finished goods in the United States as well. And we're one of only, I think, three companies in the country that makes toys on a mass scale here in the United States. And we hope that by being an example of how you can make it happen in toys, that if you can do it with toys, you can do it with anything. To compete in the global market, the Rodon Group is always on the edge of innovation. They utilize many automated machines and robotics. The latest robot that we bought is a guy called Baxter. He was made by Rethink Robotics, a, former, a bunch of former MIT grads, brilliant people. And he's the first robot, not only is the robot made in the US, but can work next to people and has vision and can learn. And, it, and so you, within an hour of taking Baxter out of the box, he can be working for you. <laughs> I'm too short. OK, now I can. <laughs> he's making nice little rows. As more Baxters get deployed around the country and around the world, other solutions that are solved are going to be shared with everybody in the Baxter environment. So we'll learn from others, others will learn from us, and together we'll have a much stronger manufacturing base here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's just Baxter at this point. He doesn't have any friends? He doesn't have any friends yet. No, we've got the first one in the country. Oh, awesome. Um, and they're deploying them for the rest of the year. So there should be a few hundred out in the country by the end of the year, wow. and then hopefully thousands in the years to come. He looks very muscular. <laughs> Get tired. Yeah. As if all that isn't impressive enough, the factory has less than 1% waste, recycling enough plastic to make 1 million Connects sets every year. The local Made in the USA treasure even grabbed the attention of the president, who flew in late last year for a visit. The staff built a 50,000 piece American flag in just a day and a half. And what did the president say about it? He was impressed. He said, that's what I mean by made in the USA. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You know, and, um, and, and it, was a, it was one of those moments that you never expect to have, but was, was wonderful to be a part of, um, and gave our people the feeling that really anything is possible. It was really fun to see how these were made. It's going to be even more fun to play with them.
Welcome. The Connect's headquarters is just a short drive down the road. We design and develop all of our products soup to nuts. Downstairs here is kind of the creative part of the business. Upstairs is the serious part of the business. They wear suits and things upstairs. We wear <laughs> t-shirts and jeans downstairs. downstairs. The Connect's creative team consists of six full-time designers, four engineers, four duplicators, along with interns and support staff. Wow. Woo. It's like Hello. Toy Central. It's Toy Central. It's so, a clean toy room. Yeah, it's pretty clean. <laughs> they cleaned up they cleaned up for you guys a little bit. We have to develop in, in a way that's a little different than a typical toy company or product development firm where you would just draw ideas or do computer drawings. We have to build, you have to draw with your hands, so we call them sketches. So they're building connects, building Lincoln Logs, building Tinker Toys, they're making sketches of the products they want to make. And this all has to be within the confines of a certain price point make it up. It's a 40 or $50 price point that he's designing towards. So he'll come up with a number of different ball machines and we'll sell them internally. We'll sell them amongst the designers. We'll go talk to the marketing team. We'll talk to sales guys. We'll talk to whoever in the company can have an endpoint. And then we'll finally say, yes, it's a toy we want to make. So we say, okay, turn it on. And at that point, we turn the product over. And now we go through the process of recreating the designer sketch digitally. So for, so for all the ideas that are out there, how many of those ideas that you create out there actually are sold, Very sold within the company and Very make few. it? The story yes. used to go that for every slot that we needed to fill, say a one $30 item, we'd come up with 10 good ideas to fill that one slot. But to get 10 good ideas, you need 100 bad, bad ideas. ideas. So it's right. a lot of trial and error. It's the funnel. Put a lot of things in the funnel, and hopefully something great comes out. Duplicators then rebuild the ideas to make sure they'll really work for kids. 14 years of building toys. What's it like to come to work every day? Great. <laughs> Do you have any kids, grandkids, or uh, the who are pl play with this stuff too? And you get down on the floor and play with them? Yeah, once in a while. <laughs> Are they better than you at putting them together? Uh, no. No. <laughs> not yet, right? No, I put Norm up against anyone on the planet pretty much. The normal, point. Maybe the normal grandfather, but not the one that works at Connects. Right. You're not going to be better than him. <laughs> so right now we're finalizing our product line for 2014, and we're well into thinking about what we're going to do for 2015. Hmm. Is it secret, or can you give us some clues? Uh, some of it's secret. <laughs> Tell us that part. The secret part? <laughs> That's a good part. And well, how about just tell us what we're going to see under everybody's Christmas trees this year? Um, this year we have new roller coasters at different price points, which are always a favorite among kids. We have uh, our newest license for this year would be Pac-Man Pac coming in. Now. So it's hitting the shelves now. We also have Angry Birds stuff, which is in its second year. That's right. And Nintendo, which is in its third year. Third year. Yep. We've had such a good time spending the day at Connex. I haven't had time to build this Ferris wheel. Marie, what do you think? Hold on, Kim, I'm just finishing up my last piece. <laughs> hey, great minds think alike. Let me power mine up. Welcome back to Talk of the Town, Zach's Picks. A core piece of Talk of the Town is Kim and Marie's hands-on participation when being taught a recipe or trade. I think getting them out of their comfort zones with chefs, artists, and craftsmen makes good TV. Let's see how they did making jewelry by hand. Sincerely Sarah Jewelry started when I was in junior high school, and I've always been passionate about the arts, and a trip to New Mexico actually got me really interested in jewelry. And it kind of grew from there. Uh, one of my high school teachers uh, told me to take a class down at the Bomb School of Art in metalsmithing. And from there, uh, the passion continued to grow. And I went to Cedar Crest College and took a four-year program there for metalsmithing and have turned it into a small retail and wholesale business for myself. What are you making right now? This, what I'm making right now, is one of my watch face pendants. 
Um, so I'm going to take two leaves and we're going to solder them onto the vine. And then it's going to go through the watch face here and twist around so that it makes a pendant. My jewelry is very nature inspired. Usually I have some kind of concept of what the finished piece is going to look like. Usually it does evolve and change through the course of actually making it. The metal kind of takes on its own persona and develops itself as I'm working. Um, I like working in copper. It's a very easy material to work with and shape with the way you want to. Um, it also takes on the antiquing and the colors very well. There are bits of bronze and nickel silver in the pieces as well. And any of the earrings have sterling silver ear wires. So I like to use higher quality materials, but nothing that puts the jewelry into a price range that's you know, out of reach of you know, us people. <laughs> so today we're gonna work on our ring and a pair of earrings um, in copper. And we're gonna do some sawing and texturing and finishing. So you wanna hold this in your left hand. Mm -hmm. Tight, but not so tight. You don't wanna have a death grip on it. Okay. You wanna leave it a little bit loose. That way if it catches in the metal, it's not gonna break the blade. Mm -hmm. If you break the blade, that's okay. We've, <laughs> we've got oh hundreds no! of blades here. <laughs> and hold your blade straight up and down. I am actually impressed that you haven't broken a blade. <laughs> if we had been reversed and I was doing the ring and she was doing this, because you're the drill bit girl, so. Yeah, I, I break it, drill bits it all the time. Been. <laughs> <laughs> well, I almost got there. Look how close I am. You might be able to just pop it out. No, I think it's not quite, no, we'll not quite close enough. Here. See, you jinxed me. I was doing so good. <laughs> that yeah. wasn't me. Oh, uh, yes, it was. <laughs> All right, so stick it in there, give it a good bang. Once you get the technique down, it's like riding a bike. <laughs> Next, we're gonna texture. So we're okay. gonna use a little dot. This is yep. all you're hitting it with and you wanna get it as straight up and down as possible when you're hitting. So now we've gotta file those edges a little bit smoother. The filing is what takes a while. It does, yeah. That's probably the most time consuming part of any piece. Now we need to drill holes because we have to attach them to the ear wires. We need to first do a little punch so that way the drill bit doesn't dance around on the surface of the metal. Spot. Mm -hmm. Give that one a good whack. Okay, and pull that back up and you're good. We are going to just grab a hold of the tip of that through the hole so you mm -hmm. get a nice grip on it. And this is liver sulfur. And what it's doing is darkening the entire surface of the metal. So. We want to get that nice and dark. It's pretty much black now. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then to finish it, what we're going to do is take that sandpaper mm -hmm. and do exactly what you just did and sand the whole surface. Mm -hmm. And if you'll notice, then the, the impressions that you made with the hammer, they're oh, all going to stay dark. Very cool. And the rest of it's going to expose the copper. And mm -hmm. the sandpaper gives it kind of a satin finish. Mm -hmm. So you can leave it that way or you can polish it and make it really shiny. If you notice then, mine had a little bit of a curve to them. Yeah, I did. Kind of just keep tapping it all the way down. Mm -hmm. So there we have a nice gentle curve. All right, so if I do it not like the other one, then I'm <laughs> giving it to you and we're gonna flatten it out again. <laughs> <laughs> Lay it next to the other one and see Just check. how the curves compare. There you go. Let's do those. Okay, I think cool. they're done. Mm -hmm. Are they done? They are done. All right, so Sarah, I looked at all your stuff and figured I could maybe make a ring with your help. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can definitely make a ring. Um, so I got you started here okay. um, with a piece of wire that is cut to the size that it would be appropriate for your ring. Okay. And I've gone ahead and I've grinded down the end to a point for you. Uh, but now we've got a really rough surface. So you are going to need to file this so it's nice and smooth. And keep spinning the clamp as you're filing it around. I feel like I need to be careful because I don't want to break it right in half. <laughs> you're not going to break it. That is the beautiful beautiful part of metal uh, is it's very forgiving. If you drop it on the floor, it's not going to shatter like a piece of glass. So you don't have to be too careful around it. 
Yeah, you're not gonna damage it. And now what we're gonna do is fan out the other end. Sounds like I'm gonna hit it. Yes. On this thing? On that. Always look at what you're hammering. Don't look at, don't watch the hammering. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and keep your fingers yes. away. Yes. Okay. Am I going down far enough? Yep, you're down far enough that way. Now hit this end a little bit more so we have a nice fan. Starting to look like something. I don't know what, yeah, but it's something. It's getting a little bit smoother, okay. This is a texturing hammer and it's got all sorts of different, like this one's got lines in it. This one is, you can create dots. So um, we could so do squares, we could do diamonds. Diamonds it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then just keep going until the texture is covering. Whoops. Helps if you actually <laughs> hit it. <laughs> Should I stand back a little bit? <laughs> well, I'm close. <laughs> so now what we've done is we've work hardened this. Um, mm -hmm. See, it's pretty stiff. Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna have to do is we're going to need to anneal it. Um, we have to heat it up with the torch. Um, okay. So that way it makes the particles of the metal realign and it makes it softer to work with. Now with those. <laughs> yes, because it's yeah, going to be hot. hot. It's really hot. So just pick it up and put it in the water to quench it. And you can immediately pull it right back out. Gets cold quickly, huh? Yep, right away. Okay. You can touch it right away. And then it's going to be a lot more pliable now that so we can bend it into the position that we want to. Cool. Okay. Now we need to turn this stick into a ring. Into a ring. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's pretty stick. So right there. Yep. And then, and then gently twist it. And then keep going. Yep. I would keep going. Am I a little doing bit okay? More. Yep. Got a nice gentle curve going. All right. That looks about good. So we just want to start with the flat part. And because we softened it, it wraps around it really nicely. And we're going to keep wrapping it around. Camera yeah, from both sides. This is also hardening it again, so it's not going to bend when it's on your finger. Now we need to antique it. Okay, cool. So, so we drop it in that. For these, I don't antique the entire surface. Okay. I antique just the textured portion. We want to get the outside nice and shiny and take away some of that antiquing so we can see the texture. Yeah, it's a little dangerous. Yes, but it does give you a nice shine to your finger. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to move over to the rouge and I just keep moving the metal around in my hand. I don't want to stay on one spot too long. So now we've got a nice high shine to that copper part, cool. but we still have the darkness behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very nice. I do um, the wholesale sales for some of my items um, that I can kind of easily replicate. Uh, some of them are still unique, uh, like the rings will take on their own shapes, and that's the way I sell them. I sell my pieces as being unique and one of a kind. I can never 100% duplicate an item, um, but I do kind of build collections based off of a theme. So whether it's a certain leaf pattern or a geometric shape, I'll build a, a whole collection around one item. So if a store is interested, they can purchase you know, the earrings, necklace, rings, everything to coordinate and match. Locally, uh, you can find my jewelry at Creative Framing by Carla in Palmerton and also down in Cleo's in Bethlehem. And I do several retail shows, um, you know, in the local area throughout the year. By now you might be wondering how a segment gets chosen to be one of Zach's picks. I have a few reasons. Many I had fun while shooting with Kim and Marie and our guests. Some were incredible experiences and others I was especially happy with the final product. This next segment was fun to shoot and I love cheesecake. Mmm, cheesecake. It's one of my favorite desserts. It is my favorite dessert. And we're here at Pocono Cheesecake Factory where we're gonna learn how to make these amazing cheesecakes from the pros. Cheesecake is a very simple recipe. You're gonna see all five ingredients right here. We start out with about 150 pounds of uh, cream cheese. It's a lot That's of serious. cream. <laughs> it's a lot of cream cheese. Uh, it's gonna be 30 plus uh, 
pounds of uh, fresh eggs. That's the whole egg. We just blend them together. It's the egg, the yolk, and the white is blended together. Down here we have about uh, 30 pounds of sugar. Uh, just a touch of flour uh, uh, creates a little bit of a binder. And we have a couple of gallons of fresh milk. That's All right. it. We'll start out by dumping in the 150 pounds of cream cheese. I don't want to drop it. Oh, and I don't want you to drop it. <laughs> I didn't do it quite as neat as Al did, <laughs> but it's all in. This is quite a mixer. Yes, it's. Uh, you can see this is Brutus and Bertha. It's a. <laughs> it's a 140 quart mixer. Last one. Everybody, get in there. You want to blend the, the uh, ingredients together without incorporating a lot of air into the product. Yeah. Slowly, and I want you to put about half of that in there. About half of it or about not half, half of it? Half, half, about, half a gallon. About half a gallon. I want exactly a half a gallon. <laughs> I'm splashing. <laughs> yes, you are. That's all right. He who cooks also cleans. Oh, that's true. Oh, <laughs> let's see. Not quite there yet. Look pretty good or a little more? That's good. That's good? I was just, I was just uh, kidding about exactly that. <laughs> We have to uh, constantly scrape to make sure that all the, the uh, product is incorporated well together. You don't have any big lumps in there, right? Yeah, I mean, big scrape. lumps. Scrape. Right. Yeah. So just no all, big lumps. Yeah. Just walk around. Looks good. No, I don't see any lumps. Not a lot of ingredients, but definitely a process to make sure it turns out great. You can have our recipe if you'd like it, but I won't give you all the exact steps as far <laughs> as putting it together. Yeah. There's a lot of things that uh, the blending and the baking is really what's critical when it comes to cheesecake. It's an old dessert. You know, the first recorded uh, uh, record of cheesecake being made were by the ancient Greeks. It's rich, it's tasty, it's uh, sometimes it can be addictive and uh, it's uh, had a lot of staying power. It's been around a long time. And just in it goes. Just in a little at a time. a lot of sugar. This bowl is getting very full. And we're not, we're not nearly finished. We still have to put in 33 pounds of eggs. <laughs> At least we don't have to crack them all. That's right. <laughs> that, that is a bit time consuming. <laughs> I would think that's probably the most time consuming. Yeah. The question is, is there going to be room in the bowl? <laughs> wow. I think the trick is just not to put the mixer on too high once it's all full. Uh, that could be a problem. <laughs> I think it's gonna fit. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure only because you measured it out. <laughs> if we were in charge of measuring it out, I couldn't promise what would happen. <laughs> a little prep work ahead of time. We take and put a light coating of uh, baking grease on the bottom of the pan, and then a very fine coating of uh, cookies. Of course, keeps the, uh, the batter from sticking to the pan, and also adds a little color to the bottom of the cake. But our recipe does not have uh, a graham cracker crust or a cake crust as you know, some of the other uh, more prominent recipes out there will call for a graham cracker crust or a cake crust. That's a lot of cheesecake. I hope we don't spill it. Is that called the dipper? This is the dipper and every one of our cakes are hand dipped and what I want you to do when you dip this, I want exactly five and a quarter pounds. <laughs> the scale over there, exactly. we're going to have to let's get... Just, let's just see how close... Oh. <laughs> okay, right. so you need a little more. A little bit more. So. All right. I would assume not enough is better than too much. Easier to put it in than take it out. That's exactly right. Wow, look at that. Five, Five and, and a quarter. quarter. Does it feel like five and a quarter yet? Not yet. I'm going to stop there. It's not even close. No, you don't think so? Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> Five and a quarter is what five we're going for, huh? Like five boxes of butter and one stick. <laughs> Perfect analogy. <laughs> too much. Oh, yeah. yeah too I was, much. I was thinking, yeah, you're like. <laughs> I was 
trying to go uh, more. Uh, 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 <laughs> I might have been a little closer to my over. What was, what was that about being easier to add than it is to take out? <laughs> yeah. There she was go. just, there you go. She okay. was just doing that as a bonus for someone. Okay, Zach, let's see what you got. What was the rule? One whole scoop and then and a little. part. What'd you say? How many things of butter? Yeah, but I wasn't accounting for the pan. You know? <laughs> you gotta... Ooh, what do you think, Al? That's too much. Ooh. That's too much. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, yeah, he's heavy. All right, now he I've got work to do. Cheesecake. Sorry, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> You're no better than uh, us, Zach. Well, this could, this could take a while, you know? <laughs> It's been a total of 30 years now that the uh, Pocono Cheesecake Factory has been here. How many kinds of cheesecake do you make? Well, we typically have at least 10 different varieties in our, uh, in our uh, display case uh, at any one time. Of course, our traditional old-fashioned cheesecake is our best seller and it outsells everything else five to one. Which holiday is upon us? Easter. Easter. And what do we have for Easter? Cheesecake eggs. Cheesecake <laughs> Easter egg. Very I've never good. had a cheesecake Easter egg. Boy, what a mess we got here. <laughs> okay. Newbies. Newbies. Just pour it in. Just pour it in. All the way to the top. All the way to the top. No overflow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I just have to tell you, if you're looking for the neat one, it's Marie, not me. Although I did pretty good there. These, of course, are the uh, plain cheesecake Easter eggs, but we will also uh, be offering a peanut butter flavored egg oh, nice. that's going to be covered in chocolate, which is always, of course, a big seller. You know, you have to have chocolate covered eggs for Easter. Absolutely. Now we're with Perina Rose, and these are the little Easter eggs that we made out of cheesecake, but now we get to decorate them, right? Yeah. What do we do first? All right. We made a chocolate ganache. It's just cream and chocolate okay. melted together, and we're going to just dip them. You want to mm. knock off the excess to excess. Not that too much. looks amazing. <laughs> and then it falls. You can do halfway. He's going under. <laughs> I would definitely be dunking mine and waiting for that excess and not too much of the excess. Yeah, off. Right. So now we're just going to wait for these to set up and then we'll decorate them. There's my first one. <laughs> my Easter egg is done. It looks good. Gee, it certainly seems to me that things are being awfully quiet over here. <laughs> We're all thinking hard. We're Creating hard thinking. These, these works of art. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Look, I just oh, wiped my bunny face oh, off. Oh, you smeared him. He was doing so well. Give me the bottle. yellow. I'll fix him. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta fix him. These look just like Easter to me. Now, can you buy your eggs all year long, or this is just an Easter specialty? It's just an Easter specialty. They're two for five dollars. Um, you get them fully dipped in chocolate, half dipped. We could do plain also. We've gone through all the other work. The cheesecake have been blended perfectly. You did a fantastic job. They've been in the <laughs> oven for about an hour and 15 minutes. Now we get to take them out and see what kind of job you did. Okay. All right. So just uh, be careful. It's very hot. Very hot. And uh, I'll bring the rack over here and get them a little closer to you. They're still a little wobbly in the middle. That's yes. it. Oh, my goodness. You yes. Be careful. Once the cake comes out of the oven, it has to set up. It has to cool at room temperature for an hour or so. But then it has to uh, uh, relax in the refrigerator overnight. So that's when it actually uh, will firm up and become cheesecake. Nice. Have you ever dropped one? <laughs> I, I once. <laughs> Only once in all the years you've been doing this? That's yes. pretty good. Yeah, no, well, once at the oven. <laughs> once at the but, oven. Uh, I'll tell you where somebody always drops one is, you know, we do have to get them out of the pan. That is a lot of cheesecake. I can't decide which one we should try. Fall away from the edges. Mm -hmm. So, that's the easy part. <laughs> now you just hope that nothing's stuck, right? There yeah, you go. That's right. Now, here's the hard part. Now you're going to turn it back over. That's right. But you have to, it's all in the wrist. You have to do yeah. it quickly because otherwise it'll slide off the board. Flip it quick. Flip it. Ready? Yep. yep. Okay, put it. Yep. There you go. <laughs> lift, lift the pan off. 
Easy. Voila! Yay! Yay! Okay. Now, now, smell that. Chocolate and cheesecake all together. Wow. This? Voila! Woo! Yay! <laughs> Feel it's still sticking at one spot. I'm afraid to pull it away. Well, it's no. another one of those, there we go. if you break it, you, you buy to, it. You have to eat it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> slide it, slide it off. There you go. Whoop. Beautiful. There you go. Now it goes back on the rack, right? It goes back on the rack. Now's the best part of this segment. We get to taste. You'll have to come here to try it for yourself. Yum. Welcome back. To wrap up Zach's picks, I want to go back to the beginning. The style and format of Talk of the Town has evolved over the years, from a primarily studio show to one shot on location. But as you'll see now, even in our first episode in 2010, we took some baby steps out into the wild. What you see on the table in front of us right now are some things that I found on a little scavenger hunt to make wreaths. Now, we talked a little bit about the fact that it can be really expensive about the, around the holidays mm -hmm. to decorate your home, but it doesn't have to be. So let's take a look at what I did out in the field a little earlier. The great thing about a project like this is you can find supplies just about anywhere without spending any money. All you have to do is take a walk outside, take a look around, take a hike in the woods, and you can find things, if you use your imagination, that would look perfect to decorate your home, like these purple berries. Maybe I don't need the snipper for this one. The one thing you don't know is you know, how well these things are going to hold up in a wreath or in an arrangement. So it's all about experimentation. And from year to year, you find out what works and what doesn't, and you get better and better every time. One of my favorite materials to use as a filler are the tall grasses. Now, we have them here in the garden, but you can find these sometimes just growing along the side of a highway. And if you don't think you'll get in trouble, you can always just stop and pick some. Now these are green. They don't look like much right now, but what happens, and I've learned this because I've done it in the past, you learn from year to year, as soon as you make a wreath, you have to work with them when they're green, when they look like this. You cut them and work with them immediately. If you don't do that, what happens a day or two after you make the wreath is everything dries out and it gets all puffy. It looks beautiful, but it is not easy to work with at that point and it will definitely fall apart. You have to keep your eyes open because you never know when you're going to find something good. Ooh, like these. Once you've collected all your supplies, it's time to see what you can create. I like to use these metal wreath forms that are really cheap and you can use them over and over and over again. When one year's done, you just rip off the old stuff and start fresh. So we're going to start with a grass wreath today. You want to buy wire that's rolled around this plastic. You want to keep it in one long piece. That's one of the tricks. When I first started making wreaths, I thought that you used just a whole bunch of different pieces of wire to keep it together, but you, you just keep on wrapping it. So you start by attaching it to your wreath form. And then you just kind of see what happens. You can just start grabbing pieces of your grass. And we're going to trim as we go along. And it really is very simple. People are afraid they're going to make a mistake. All you do is roll it till it holds and you keep on working the same direction. And you can always trim and change things as you go along. So you don't have to worry about making a mistake because you really can't make a mistake. It's your project. It can look like whatever you want it to look like. The wire 
you really don't see once the wreath dries and everything puffs around it. Right now, when you look at it, you think, ew, I see all this wire. But truly, once it, once it starts to dry more, you won't notice it. And you just snip your ends, whatever you don't like, just snip it off. And you have a grass wreath, the base at least. And later on when we're in the studio, you'll get to see what this looks like when it dries a day or two because it's gonna puff all up. This is green, this is how you wanna work with the material. All right, and of course when you're done with that much of the wreath, you need to like make bows and things like that, decorate the wreaths a little bit more. Um, here is that wreath, why don't you hold that up because this is the wreath that- I was very impressed with you, Marie. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> self-taught, <laughs> self-taught. Um, you see how it's puffier now? This is, and if you touch this, it starts to fall apart a little bit and that's why you wanna make sure that you're working with that material like I did in the video segment when it was just picked because this, if you start touching this, it's gonna start falling apart. Now what's amazing is you hang this on your front door and the wind doesn't really bother it that much. You, you know, you'll lose a little bit, but it's not that bad because these things are used to being in nature. They're just not used to being handled and touched. So if you try to make the wreath today, this would all fall apart and it would be pretty bald. <laughs> but now what you're gonna do is put that down. We have the hot glue gun here, all hot, for you, ready for you. So now, this is just the base of a wreath. You can do absolutely anything you want with it. Now, what I picked were these dried seed pods and your job is to They're experiment cool. with them and however you'd like to attach them to the wreath, you can attach them to the wreath. Experiment. Just I, with, experiment. Just yeah, you, with a you drop said of you're hot good, glue. With a drop of hot glue. You said you're great with the hot glue gun. And I you am saw good with you hot also glue. saw in the segment, I'm gonna show everybody this wreath. Um, you saw that I was picking some other things besides just the grasses. Um, I picked, and if you remember from the video segment, you probably saw these things on this wreath, uh, the purple berries that I talked about and the different kind of seed pods and Basically, they're just dead flower heads, and they're um, very, very interesting looking. Um, the, and I was surprised because- The flowers are beautiful. Well, and remember when I picked them in the video segment, I'm like, y you never know how these things are gonna hold up. Well, they're still purple, and that was, uh, you know, about a week or so ago. So, you know, they're still purple. So for a season, you know, and like I said, when, when you're done with these wreaths, you know, you don't expect these things to last forever. They get dusty from hanging up, and, and from year to year, you can always just rip this off and start over next year. If you have these flowers growing in your yard, or you know where you got them the first time, you can go get them again and make a similar wreath if you like something like this one really came out Nice, I thought um, I had never worked with these materials before, but uh, I, I had a good time with it, and I thought it came out pretty, pretty nice. So I'm I making like the a little pointy, the little pointy things look like little porcupines. Those are from cone flowers. That's the the dead head of a cone flower. So what I'm going to do now, you, you're hot gluing away over there. I am hot gluing I, away, and this is perfect for me. And you know <laughs> what? This kind of project I think would be great to do with the kids too. Absolutely, yeah. You never know, and like I said, you can't really. I mean, you're going to make things that that you decide you're never going to make again if it's something that was difficult to work with, or you know, you start putting something together and it doesn't work the way you really wanted it to work. But um, you know, a lot of times it's just experimentation and, and figuring out what works. Like that grass wreath uh, that you're working on, I made similar grass wreaths and I thought, okay, well they're gonna be, you know, maybe they'll last a year. I had them for seven years before I thought they looked too bald and, and finally ripped them apart and made some new ones. So some of the things will surprise you and you know, you can't get a cheaper decoration for your home than something you've just picked outside all by yourself. So the biggest investment is the hot glue gun. <laughs> You're probably right. <laughs> Which you can get a hot glue gun for probably like 10 bucks. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, there's different sizes, and this is like a medium-sized one, which I found to be the small ones. Sometimes are a little too small. And they're the ones that you can get, you know, really reasonably priced. This one I put a bow on, and that's an important ending touch. It also the bow is also important because if you have a section of your wreath when you make the wreath and you uh, look at it for the first time, and there's a a yucky part, <laughs> that's where the bow goes. That's where the bow goes. <laughs> that's where the bow goes, okay? So I think I did that already with this one because I, I did that when I put this hanger on it so that I knew where I wanted where I wanted the bow to go. And you have another job. You have to pick which bow you want. I made some bows. And, and you can also change the bows because right now it's almost, you know, we're getting close to, well, we have different kinds of holiday bows. This one's a Halloween bow. This could be just a fall bow. So you could basically make this wreath, you know, sometime in early October, put this bow on it, and then when Halloween's over, ditch it and 
you know, put this one on it for a Thanksgiving wreath, and it, it carries over. Well, I like this wreath, too. And I like this bow. Now you have to puff the bow. It's a little squished, so let's puff it up a little bit. All right. I'll puff up the bow. <laughs> You can always do that when it's on the wreath too. But um, and as far as like the wire, you know, the, the ribbon is not cheap either. And mm -hmm. wired ribbon I find to be the friendliest because you can move it however you want it to be. But the best thing to do is buy it after the holidays. After every holiday, I have I have a big bin of ribbon in my basement for pretty much every holiday that I bought. You know, the week after the holiday was over, I go you know to the craft store and see what they have left. And typically there's that's me after Christmas. Yeah. And All that's my how you Christmas can do it to stuff make for the it, next year. Make it a little more reasonable. Very nice. See, and these were just seed pods that came off of a tree. <laughs> we, and it looks so fall-like and uh, terrific for like Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. You can put out. And are we going to do something it. on the Facebook page with these now? Yes. How about we give away Marie's Let's wreath? Let's give them away. Let's <laughs> give them away. <laughs> so <laughs> if you, yes, all you have to do is like the wreaths and you'll be entered to win them. Oh, pretty cool. <laughs> yes. And you know what? We're just about out of time. So yes, we should we thank all of you for being with us for our first show. We're so happy that you joined us. Yes, it was it was fun. And you know what? That's, that's our plan. We want to have fun. We want to do things that are interesting. We want you to help us find things that are interesting interesting, find people who are interesting and tell us about them because we'd love to, you know, learn more and teach you more along the way. Christmas, my favorite time of the year. Absolutely. It's coming up next month. We're going to have fun. Tons of things we month. can do. Lots of things with, oh, who knows, makeup. Um, sparkly things. Sp absolutely. <laughs> Sounds we'll, like a great we'll sparkle. Idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah All right. So thanks for joining us, everyone. We hope we've inspired you to maybe be the talk of the town. What do the girls do with their hands? <laughs>